All right. So, as y'all know, we'll be talking about some NLP topics. Some of this is sequence to sequence neural machine translation. Ha <laughs> uh, ha. Basically, what we're doing is we're converting, in our case, we're turning German into English. You can do it the other way around as well, but I'm not going to teach you that. You can do that on your own. But what are we trying to solve here is kind of fundamental questions about how we understand language, right? Uh, what, I guys, what I want to teach you guys is not really the mechanism behind like what an LSTM or an RNN is, but why we're using that mechanism and understand the thought process of the future technology that surpasses an LSTM. Uh, so starting off with the kind of the basics, like, uh, you know, um, how do we read is really a fundamental question that a lot of people in uh, the NLP space ask themselves because when you know we look at text, what is the main mechanism in which we kind of utilize to to read? You know, do we read word by word? Do we read by phrases? Do we read by the entire sentence and then come up with the context afterwards? You know. One of those is correct, one of those might be wrong. No one really knows, we've kind of just had approximations, right? Another thing to ask is, you know, how do we learn? And what do we learn, right? That's a fundamental question that I think a lot of people are trying to answer because it solves this issue of, you know, the AI is only capable of, you know, putting A and B together if given the example of A and B, right? If we can solve this problem that, you know, a computer can automatically put together two examples, A and B, right, then we don't need to train a neural network anymore. We don't have to have good data. We can have bad data, and it'll just try and make assumptions about what's correct, right? So we get general purpose AI. And then uh, how do we understand kind of the same principle, right? Um, once we gather that information, how can we then, you know, understand kind of what we're, like, what should we understand about a context, right? You know, if we're given a Wikipedia page, no one really reads the entire Wikipedia page. You go to whatever you need, and then, then you subquery that and say, oh, here's the exact sentence that I need to look for, right? Case in point, the first <laughs> NLP definition that I gave you guys, right? It's, you know, natural language processing is a subfield of linguistics, computer science, information engineering, and artificial intelligence, yada, 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 right? That's like the that's like the Wikipedia definition, quite literally, right? And how did I do that? I'm not giving you the entire Wikipedia page. I'm giving you subsection of it because I understand how well you know what is important to this conversation, right? And so we kind of you know come into the issue of okay, what is the machine learning mechanism to try and solve this? You know, because machine learning algorithms, but you know, in a deep neural context, right? Which everybody likes talking about. You know, we try solving this with a DNN. Right? A deep neural network. All right? Just a bunch of connected nodes, perceptrons, so on and so forth. Right? How, how does that really you know, solve our problem? And, and the you know, quick answer is not really. Um, a language is too complex to simply chalk it up to a really large neural network and try and simulate a brain. Right? Or at least that one cortex that runs language. Right? It's too intricate and there's too many neurons to simulate um, that you know it doesn't become feasible at the slightest point right um, so you know let's not be you know too naive about it let's try and be a little bit smart um, and so you know what happens if we say let's throw a convolution neural network at it right you guys learn what convolution is it it's uh, you run a filter across an entire image or you want to filter across an entire sequence of data. Well, it's not a bad idea because we as human beings don't look at word by word sequences, right? We look at sentences in chunks. So it might not be a bad idea to do that. But of course, we run into the problem is, does a convolution neural network really scope out to language, right? Can we really embody language as a whole or can we even describe language in a convolution sense? Um, Convolution is really good at doing one thing, which is image processing. It's the most efficient mechanism to do that. But it's not really useful for our case because, like, how would you take that neural network presented to you there and try and represent a document using that, right? Um, you can, and there's ways to do it, and there's 
people who say, yeah, it's a good way to summarize, but again, we limit their scope to doing that. So I think it's in 20, a, I mean, LSTM, RNNs have been around forever. Um, but I think computationally speaking, they become viable in like 2010 or something like that. Um, when we found that, oh yeah, we can do this shit on the GPU, <laughs> right? Uh, and so RNNs and LSTMs, does anyone know what an RNN stands for? Recurrent neural network, right? So there's a recurrent problem, right? And this is a good picture to describe the difference between all three subtypes of an RNN, right? The base RNN, which has an activation function, one activation function, right? You have an input, you have, well, technically two inputs. One input is a hidden layer. The other one's your actual input, right? And then you get two outputs. Pretty straightforward. LSTM is a little bit more complicated. Does anyone know the reason why we have long, short-term memory? What the, what the point of it is, right? What the flaw of an RNN is. So typically what we want to do is, well, RNN is very basic. There's not much in terms of, you know, precognitive thought, so to speak. <coughs> so what if we can kind of keep a small, short-term memory? Okay, we understand what happened before in like the past three sentences or phrases. Um, let's see if we can, you know, based on whatever happened in the past, let's see if we can predict the future, right? The problem is, you know, we tend to, as, as you get a longer and longer sentence, you start losing the fidelity of like what was said five words away versus what was said a hundred words away, right? You know, you, if you know you're talking about the same text, like if we're writing a, we're trying to train a neural network to write a Wikipedia article, right? It will linger and wander about topics, right? Mainly because we don't have a full context of what is happening in the general sense, right? And so we solve that by adding additional gates. And that's where the L comes from, right? It's trying to maintain this kind of longer span of uh, understanding uh, as we sequentially work through a data, uh, data set, right? a data structure or input data. And then GRU is a simplified LSTM. Instead of having two gates, we have one gate. Uh, and the reason for this really was LSTMs are really difficult to drive in hardware, so what if we can simplify the compute down? And they said, well, a GRU is good enough. Um, a lot of neural networks nowadays use GRUs because it's mathematically less computations. Um, and therefore, and it produces the exact same like accuracy, give or, one percent, you know, give or take one or two percent accurate accuracy loss. Which to human beings, Language models are okay because we're a little bit more forgiving, whereas if you have an autonomous vehicle, that'd be pretty bad, right? So, you know, if Alexa screws up, it's not that big a deal. All right, so what we're trying to implement today is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. So those red and blue squares and that pink squares, are, they're all LSTM cells. Or in this case, actually, they're GRU cells, but they're RNNs, right? And we are sequentially going through a language of, you know, Guten Morgen, German, right? And we are saying, okay, we want to convert this German into English. And what is the process of doing so? Uh, we'll be using a special mechanism called attention. What is attention? Attention basically describes how, you know, where in a sentence we should look. Um, and nowadays, this was actually one of the reasons that we want to, you know, I wanted to bring up attention was because today we have grown interest in this mechanism because humans don't read like an LSTM, right? Humans don't read like RNNs. Humans read with an entire phrase and process that all at once, right? And so it's kind of like, you know, it's like batch reading in a way, right? We read an entire sentence and then we understand what happened in that sentence later. Um, that's kind of the general idea. So what if we put weight to specific phrasing, right? We'll, as a human being, we'll weight out the whole sentence, saying that the noun is more important, and so on and so forth. And that's why, um, you know, we want to focus on attention. Um, and one of the reasons that the newer models solely focuses on attention. Yes, James, you had a... <laughs> Uh, it's less gates. Gated re recurrent unit. Uh, so you have one less gate. So look at the diagram. So uh, we are removing. So we have 
this gate right here. We have this gate. I think we're passing off this gate right here. Yeah. So it's computationally less expensive, uh, mainly because, but it's mathematically like what we found in most areas is that it's com like like probability-wise, it'll produce like the same accuracy. Right? We will only see a slight drop off, and therefore because of the compute cost of an LSTM and the size of LSTMs, right, the number of, of uh, weighted values that have to be stored, we want to reduce that as much as possible. And so if we can reduce however much data, or like we get rid of an entire like hidden layer. Right? See how there's three inputs for an LSTM cell? We only have two. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, Amazon and IBM, let me clarify, they don't care what model you're running, they'll give you the VM. It's up to you to decide what model you want to run. Okay. What are the ramifications for you as a consumer of the type of budget? You're running a startup, yeah. you want to run a chat. Yes. Which, which one do you want to choose? GRU. GRU. Hmm? It's simpler. So again, it's based on what is more important to you. Is accuracy more important? If that is true, then you want to go with an LSTM. It's fundamentally more complex, more math, and therefore more compute time. But you gain a little bit more accuracy with it. With the GRU, it's less compute. You lose a little bit of accuracy, but you know, it's, it's up to you. Right? And in generally, nowadays, we're striding away from these models. And we'll talk about why and what the next generation is. Right? The newest generation, I should say. Next generation doesn't exist yet. Right? And if we have time, we'll actually go and implement one. Um, so yeah, we're doing sequence to sequence. One thing I want to get kind of straightforward is uh, word tokenization. So here's a basic mechanism. We're not going to be implementing it. I'm, we're just implementing the model for now. But here's word tokenizers. Uh, we'll be like the program itself. I built the training loop and the data preprocessing, so we just have to make the model. And so that's all we'll be doing today. But just for you guys' reference, here's what a tokenizer is it's a fundamental block in most machine le uh, or deep learning applications of natural language processing, from the most complex to largest models to like smaller RNN LSTM cell models. Like they all use tokenization of some kind. Why? Because it's a mathematic, or it's a, it's a representation of words that can be easily processed via a computer, right? Because now we're representing, rather than representing, you know, characters, which are 8-bit values, right? You represent them as 32-bit vectors, which can simplify a lot of your calculations. You increase compute complexity, but you will allow higher accuracies, right? Because you can extract more information, right? You'll have one token for those, right? Yeah. Uh, specific um, words like uh, uh, pronouns. Pronouns? Yeah. Like we can, like whatever is in your vocab can be. Uh, like I think you're talking like stop words. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's proper now. Yeah. Yeah. So we we will describe these vectors based on the vocab that you're given, right? So uh, most of the times when we do vectorization, there's typically some kind of embedding layer, right? Um, this happens way before you even get to the model. Different tokenizers will employ different embeddings. And then, so one of two things can happen. You can train the embedding alongside the model, or you can train the embedding as a uh, you know, standalone device. And then the model itself, based on whatever your tokenizer has enveloped, like discovered, right, can train to that input, right? So, you know, we can, we can allow to, you know, some flexibility in that sense. So if you want to, you know, change out your tokenizer, right, 
You can, but of course you might want to retrain your model to accept that new vocab as well. Yeah, Brian? Uh, <coughs> Typically, it's just you know a list, uh, and then we'll run some type of you know neural network underneath it. Um, so in this case, uh, we like, we're doing we're going from tokens to an embedding encoder. Um, you know we can describe like different vectors. So I think a good example of this would be like GloVe. So GloVe is an RNN. It's trained on an RNN. Uh, and basically what all it does is creates these vectors that describe single words. Um, another, uh, and like you, you create these 300 dim vectors that can then be passed on to your neural network. And since each vector is unique, we then associate that vector with a word, right? So in this case, the is 0.5, 1 1.1, or 0 0.5, 1.0. Um, you can build a tokenizer that takes into consideration um, like NER, right, NER tag. Uh, another one you can probably use is POS tagging. <coughs> but for the most part, it's like they're passed on to embedding layers that are trained alongside a lot of other neural networks. So basically in general, Yeah, you want to make them as unique as possible. Okay, because I thought that maybe it like encoding like took into account. I mean, I guess from what you said, you could. I thought it took into account like maybe um, frequency of the word. Okay. Um, so typically, when we consider frequency of word, if it's frequent, like if every sentence has the word, we may just get rid of the word, right? Because we want to capture as much data that's unique as possible, right? So in this case. Yeah, no, LSTM, like, you know, when we're, we're building a sequence model, what we would want to look at is, okay, you know, if this data is found after this data, right, if X is found after Y, right, we want to see, well, every time that occurs, we have a certain output, right, we get Z, right? So anytime we see, oh, X is found after Y, then we get Z, right? But if we keep seeing that pattern over and over again, right, we'll start developing that trend of, Oh, that must be Z then, right? So, like for example, like you know, the bus or the school or whatever, right? You, if you see those frequent that high in in a very frequent manner, right? You will start to recognize those words. So, like frequency in a way can be you know a detrimental thing, but a lot of times what we've done is it's a way of understanding our sentence structure. So having those articles and stop words, like it's a lot of controversy and also like a lot of debate about how important you know frequency of words are, um, mainly because they are integral in our you know sentence structure. Um, but at the same time, there's only a finite amount of uh, understanding that a neural network can actually learn. And so it's like, okay, you know, do we get rid of it? Do we keep it? What do we do? Right? In our case, I think we're keeping them. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah we're keeping them. But, but like that's something that you can play around with, right? What happens if you remove a certain minimum count? Or that's one thing that we are doing. We're doing minimum count, but right? Minimum count basically means the minimum in our entire vocabulary. What is the like frequency of a word, and then how many times, like how little times does it show up, right? And we want we want we tend to have one that's a little bit more prevalent because that means we'll see that token a lot in our data set, right? enough to where we can learn that, right? Yeah, so we won't overfit to that one word. But yeah. Mm -hmm. So like, are those like numbers generated by running the Not really. There's typically a context put into it. These ones are. Or in, in this case, like, so you see like there's three, val like three uh, rows, right? So those would typically represent some type of feature. Um, and we call that a latent feature because we personally don't understand it, but the computer understands it somehow, right? Um, so if we're looking at each individual value, like the rows itself, like if, the, if we go through each column, right, that means a word. And we can understand that. But the features themselves that describes that word, we don't know, 
right? And so it's not really randomized. Um, so like I said, right, most embedding layer or most of word vectorizers or or uh, or not vectorizers, but like uh, uh, tokenizers uh, that are found to co coincide with neural networks are trained alongside that architecture of neural networks. Uh, there's another algorithm called word to vec I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a very popular algorithm. But the way that word to vec works is um, we're trying to find a space in which words are commonly found. So, for example, if I feed in just like, you know, Wikipedia articles, right? If we find, you know, the word king and queen and royalty all in the same paragraph, therefore we must know that some feature exists such that that commonality, you can say that those are very similar words, right? King and queen are both very similar, right? But then all we see king, male all the time, and we see queen, female all the time, then we must know that, okay, there's some disparity there too. That's like a positive negative case, right? So, um, you know, there's a, it's not like it's randomized. There's, of course, thought put into it. Sure, you could make one that's random, right? As long as no features are the same, then you can make it that's random and, you know, maybe it'll work, right? But typically you'd want them to, you know, have some important feature vector to understand, right? Um, that's where, like, you know, if you want, you can say, okay, this NER tag <clears throat> plus the POS tag plus, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, whatever, I don't know, maybe uh, some weighted value or like, or like it's a pronoun or not, right? Like that kind of feature vector you can create that's, a, that's custom mapped, right? So now you can, you know, describe all words like this way, right? You know, that's one way. But again, it's typically trained alongside a neural network. Mm -hmm. So just to reiterate, this tokenizer is not like a set thing. There are a lot of different ways to do it. Yes. And um, what comes out is something that is black box you don't necessarily recognize. Um, um, it's one of two things, yeah. Typically, the vector itself is black box, but we can understand that if we get a certain pattern, right, that is vector, that a certain vector, then we can actually trace it back to the original value. Right, and yeah, so we got a specific vector because you know what, what is output from a neural network except a vector of number, uh, float, yeah. right? So, you know, if you find a Euclidean distance across all words in the data structure or in our, in our vectorizing vocab, right, then you know, if we find the lowest distance, then we know that with a strong confidence that that probably is the, what the word that is trying to be represented by that vector output by the neural network. Even though it may not be exact, it's close enough. And that's typically how the output sequence works. But yeah. OK. Um, typically, though, we'll try and focus on things that are within scope, not out of scope. So we will definitely get a vector that is within vocab. Yeah. Um, some of the problems I want to talk to you guys about are in analysis. I kind of like this because. I also want people to recognize that they are not a one-stop shop. Like machine learning is extremely fragile. Like and like the devs, like there are very few situations where it'll work 100% of the time um, because it is a probability function, right? So an important issue these both LSTMs and GRUs face. Like not as much LSTMs, uh, more GRU, more like normal RNNs is vanishing gradients. It's where we kind of forget what direction we're going, right? Like I said when we're trying, when I was talking about kind of like how LSTM solved the issue with RNNs, um, that's exactly the problem that occurs. LSTMs, if we get to a critical mass length, they'll tend to forget exactly what they were talking about in the first place. So we lose focus, kind of way. Um, they're very large models. Ten RNNs are much bigger than convolution neural networks. Um, they're both memory and compute intensive. Um, so we typically run them on GPUs. There's no way you can run it on a CPU. It's really slow. Even though, since they're recurrent problems, they'd be perfect for CPUs. Just the amount, sheer amount of math required is why we run them on GPUs. Um, and of course, they're complex runtimes because they are recurrent models, right? Recurrency is very difficult to drive uh, on a GPU just because of the way GPUs work, which is called SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. Um, therefore, uh, having you know, these complex runtimes uh, means that you don't get the performance that you want if you're, you know, 
uh, like exactly what you're saying, right? You'd spend more cycles doing an RNN maybe versus maybe a DNN or a convolution neural network. Um, and that's just the given of the model. So let's get into coding. Um, let's see. How much did I talk for? Uh, 10 minutes? What is it, 20 minutes? Yeah. Coding. Okay. So you all got this thing working, right? This is the one? No, this is my copy. Where did Andrew's laptop go? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, yes, I would need it. But uh, okay. So first thing you gotta do, uh, make sure your runtime is okay. I forgot to do that, but I think it should default. Yeah. So runtime is GPU, right? Um, and so what this is doing is downloading the language models. In our case, we're using English and German. De Deutschland. Now that it's all loaded. I got some hyperparameters like kind of set aside for you guys to play with, um, so we can just like load those in. Uh, here we're doing the data pre-processing. A lot of these things have to do with the tokenization right here, uh, having you know the actual data set. We're using multi 30k, multi language. I think it's a data set of 30k articles. Um, of course, we're building a vocab as well. That's important because we want to understand how many words we need to kind of accommodate for. Um, so we'll run that. That one takes a little bit of time. has to download the model. Yeah? So are you using a tokenizer built into Torch? Uh, no, we're using the tokenizer built into pa Spacey. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. Hmm? Torch doesn't have tokenizer at all, right? Torch is just a... PyTorch is just a like you know program like uh, it's the runtime, right? I mean you you can program in, huh? What do you mean batch size not defined? Uh, okay, I'll define you then. If I remember correctly, it was oh no. Here, wait a minute. Hmm. Uh, yes, we do. It was ten. Yeah. Nothing. Some semicolons are okay. Uh, no, no. For if you, I think there's like a, if you call like underscore future. Like curly braces, there's a runtime error that says never, or something like that. <laughs> like the guy who invented Python hated curly braces, so that's one of the reasons that he made it, like tab based indexing. Okay, so now I guess we're going to get into the full function. So we're going to start with the encoder pipeline. That is the, actually, it's a good way of describing it, is right here. That is this part right here, the green part. So this is what we're going to be describing in this encoder, our uh, encoder, encoder cell. Um, so here, we want to start with like an embedding, right? So we're going to say self dot embedding is equal to nn dot embedding, and then we want to do input dimension and embedding dimension. Hmm. That's a new feature given by uh, the gods of Google. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it crashed? No, because he had corgis and this shit running. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, we, we aren't about that. I mean, it, it can. It's, it's WebGL. So now we're going to define our RNN cell. That's how PyTorch works. I love PyTorch, by the way. Uh, so we're going to say, we're going to call it a GRU because. I mean, you can make it at LSTM as well. Um, I think the same configuration should work. But now we're going to take basically our embedding dim, right? Um, you guys see this? Or is it like too fuzzy? Is it really small? Yeah, because it's a little fuzzy. So, like, you know, UCI decides to build towers instead of upgrading their projectors. Well, it's fine, it's not a big deal. Um, yeah, not, let's not help the visually impaired. 
and then we want to get the encoder hidden size, right? Because we want to define the weighted. Oh, oops, wrong one. I want the PowerPoint. We want to define the weighted hidden layer inside these RNN cells, right? Um, so we want to define that size. No, it's not hidden. It's hid. Uh, and of course, finally, we're going to set them to be bidirectional. Bidirectional. Okay. And then we're going to do self dot our final layer. I right, can call it nn dot linear. So now we want to take basically our encoder dimension, right? And we want to multiply it by two. Why? Because we made the RNN cell or uh, bidirectional, right? So there's two sets of weights that we need to account for. Um, one kind of the reason that we're making it bidirectional is because we also wanted to kind of understand what's going on in the future. Right, and so the way that we do that is uh, basically, if we train this neural network, it, it'll understand what's happened in the past, right? And we're trying to predict the future, but it's also seen a similar case where in the future, you know, this certain pattern pattern happened. Therefore, it's probably a high likely probability that you know the input sequence in the middle that it's trying to predict is like a certain value x, right? Uh, you guys get that? Nod, or if you say. What if the FC stands for? The what? FC something. It's like final layer. I think it had someone, like I see FC everywhere. What is it? Fully connected. Anyway, is it fully connected? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a dense layer, yeah. And I, we, yeah, so now we have to define the output side. And so we're going to say d hid dim. All right, oops. Now we're going to define the decoder's hidden dim dimensions. Uh, and then finally, we wanted to find dropout. Um, dropout is something called uh, regular, regularization. Um, all right. Um, basically, what happens is certain connections will not be made. Uh, certain, we turn off certain neurons. And the reason for this is to kind of simulate the way brains naturally grow. Um, not all neurons are connected to other neurons, right? In our brain, certain neurons will connect and then that'll be one trace, right? Basically, what we're trying to avoid is where if you get a certain input, all neurons in the network in, like, get fired, right? That's like, you know, it's like giving your computer a stroke, basically, right, in a way. Or, or epilepsy, I think, is the way to do it, right? Well, all neurons are firing in a sequence. Like, that kind of defeats the purpose of this neural, you know, you know, uh, neural network because, you know, we don't want, you know, uh, you know, having, like, inputs trigger, we want specific inputs triggering specific neurons, kind of, in a way, right? Um, that way we can dive, learn as much as possible and diversify the network itself. Uh, and it's a good way of making sure that happens. So dropout's a simple process. Now something called normalization as well, where we normalize vectors to make sure that we don't have explosive weights. In our case, we're like, no, no, thank you. We don't need that. That's too complicated. Um, yeah. And then, Andrew, I need your password. What is an explosive Exploding weights. Um, so this is kind of the issue with uh, gradient Vanishing the dimension gradients, we have your uh, exploding gradients. You know, all it is is that a certain weight will be, or a certain like neuron, for example, will get really strong, right? And what that means is, given no matter what input you give it, that neuron will fire. And what does that do, right? That typically then creates like a chain down the rest of the neural pathways, right? It says, okay, if that neuron fires, then this neuron must fire too, then that neuron must fire, and it'll go down cascading and create only one output, right? You overpower all the other decision making trees, right? Decision trees that come out of these neural networks, right? So you want to avoid exploding weights, you want to explode, you want to avoid diminishing weights because that means that you're not learning anything. Right? It's like underfitting and overfitting, right? It's the same problem. So we're trying to avoid all of that.
and uh, RNNs are notorious for them. So it's always going to be f um, it's always a it's a battle, always a battle. So here we're going to define kind of the encoder pipeline. And, you know, encoders are the easier one. Um, so we're going to say embedded uh, is equal to self dot. Uh, and I'll drop out and then self dot uh, embed. Oops, embedding, and then we're going to get our source. Right. Of course, the source being uh, language of Germans. Right. So it's going to be German. Uh, and then we want to say so we're going to do something unique here. I'm going to call it packed embedded. So utils dot rnn dot pa oops pack embedded. Uh, 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 oh, packed, padded, embedded, ah. sequence, ah. and here we pass an embedded, all right, and in this case, all we're doing is um, padding the inputs. So if we have 64 values, right, we want to pad the RNN sequence to 64 values or like 128 values or whatever, right. Um, simplifies a lot of the problems. Mm -hmm. It allows us to have a uniform training set and also a uniform testing set too. Um, so we're going to get packed. So now we're going to basically describe uh, our neural network runtime self dot rnn and I'm going to do this on packed embedded okay and then outputs mm, and then we're going to forget about the other one nn dot utils dot rnn dot pad <coughs> sequence and there is a packed out and then finally I'm going to do a concatenation of self.fc right our final layer uh, torch.cat Oops. Torch dot cat uh, hidden bracket minus two. Um, and then we want to also cat uh, hidden minus one. Uh, and then you need to set the dimension. Okay, so oh, I need another parenthesis. Oh, that's what I was missing. Okay, dim equals one. And this is just for our sake. I, um, we're defining now kind of our hidden output. So. Um, Oh. oh, I mean, this one doesn't really matter because we're just outputting it. Concatenate, yes. We're concatenating the result of our fully connected layer. Uh, and, oh, sorry, this is supposed to be 10H. 10 10H. 10 uh, here, the torch, we're concatenating the... Uh, Second and first uh, lay hidden layers. So, yeah. So we're we're if we have. Uh, so I'm trying to remember what the embedding dim. 
So right now the hidden dim size is 512. Yeah. And so we'll get 512 vector. So we're getting like the last two values out of those vectors. The last two uh, the stacks, right? Arrays on the vectors. Or actually, no, this is a layer count. So the, the, we're getting the last two layers of the hidden layer, which are 512 size. There we go. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So hidden is like, it is like, uh, if you want to think about it, it's the internal matrix that defines the weights inside the neuro, uh, RNN cell, right? So typically when we are fully connected, that's our weight, right? Those are the weights, we have the biases, that's the function that we do, right? And in this case, uh, we want to pass those weights onto the next one neural network, right? Our next cell. And, you know, if you want to think about it, it's like... Um, telling the next person what your thought process is, is right? right? If you're writing code like collaboratively, for example, right? And you're, you, you, you typically kind of re, uh, write comments, right? Like kind of explaining what you're doing here. Same way the hidden layer kind of is that, that process. It's that mechanism of telling the next cell what its thought process was when it was creating that output. Um, and there is where we tend to lose like we, if you want to track, if you track those hidden weights, um, you will see that you know as you do, you know decrease uh, or you increase the you know length of the sequence, you will see the diminishing in gradient weights. Those will go up and down, and, right? Um, so, so food for thought. All right, uh, nine twenty-eight. Oh yeah, yeah, we have to do hidden. Yeah. Okay. So now we'll get to the attention model. This one's a little bit it's not too complicated. This one's easy too. So we want to define our attention function. Like what is attention? Right? And attention really is just it's a linear layer. Linear and it's of the code hid dim times two. And we want to add that to DC hid dim, right? <coughs> we know DEC hid dim. So we defined our dimension basically to describe the hidden layer. Um, and hidden layer, we go back to the PowerPoint, is uh, this part right here. Right, so those little connections. Uh, that kind of describes the hidden layer in this model. Uh, our decoder is like like this chunk right here. Um, but yeah. Right. Mm, yeah. And so, once we have our attention defined, again, we want to have one more model layer um, describing the combination of each one of those hidden chunks. So we're going to say nn dot <coughs> linear uh, dec hid dim and then we're going to say uh, one bias false. Okay. So we get one output from this hidden layer particularly. Mm, yeah, right here. Oh, whoops, one in the front. Yeah. So, dot unsqueeze. So we're now all we're doing is trying to get the dimensions to fit. It's kind of like making Lego blocks, except you are forcing it. Or, oops, this is dimension one. Dot. 
repeat one src len source len comma one. It's kind of like uh, trying to put a square peg in a round hole. That's all we're doing here. Um, and then we're going to try and get the encoder outputs and do the same thing. Uh, except uh, it's not really the same. It's permute 0, comma, 1, comma, or hmm? Oh. So let's say we have a vector that is, or a tensor that is the size one and two, right? If we see unsqueeze, what it'll become is one, one, two. If we say unsqueeze zero, it'll be one, one, two. If we say unsqueeze three, it'll become one, one, two, one. All we're doing is we're adding a extra dimension to the vector tensor uh, to the specific position that we tell it, right? So, does that answer it? Sorry, no, I, I, yeah, let me, let me draw it for you. Oh, shit. Okay. So, let's say we have, you know, this is a vector, right? It's, a, you know, two by three, correct? Right? And so, if we say unsqueeze, all we're going to do, let's say unsqueeze, you know, u0, right? All we're going to do is say this is 1. So now we put this in a list, right? If we say, oh, unsqueeze, um, that one, zero, three, uh, or in this case, we actually, we want to do 2, right? We want to put it after. We'll say, we'll put an x1 here, right? You get it? So now we'll have, you know, right? It's like lists of lists of lists of lists, correct? So all you're doing is you're changing the dimension of it by adding or removing uh, one dimension to it, right? So you can take a three-dimensional value, convert it into two-dimensional, as long as that dimension is a one. The dimension? No, the dimension that you're, you're removing. So unsqueeze adds a dimension, squeeze removes a dimension, right? And the important thing is that dimension is one. It's always going to be a value of one, right? So you can't unsqueeze the dimension of two because where is that data supposed to go, right? For if you want to do unsqueeze a two, there's something called uh, there's like a tiling mechanism. So you can do that if you have a dimension of two, where you, depending on how you want to manipulate your data. Or you can do things like transformations, yeah, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's not that complicated. You're yeah. over. You're overcomplicating it yourself. Um, you read the documentation. It's there. PyTorch has good documentation. That's one thing you can count on. Uh, so uh, energy. So now we're going to define the main proponent of this, which is going to be torch dot ten h self dot attention torch dot cat. Uh, so the hidden which is one of the inputs, encoder uh, outputs, uh, and then, oh, this needs to be another array. <laughs> we, <coughs> uh, and then we do dim equals two. Cool. And then attention is equal to self dot v energy and then we're going to say dot squeeze uh, 
uh, two. And of course, one more modification to it. Tension uh, the dot masked fill mask is equal to zero. And we're going, if ever it's equal to zero, we will equal that to minus one E 10. And of course, we have FM softmax. Okay. Uh, missing a U. Where? Okay. This one? Mask fill? It's a fill. Uh, you fill any value that's equal to zero with uh, minus one to the ten. So you can uh, get rid of biases. So, well, NLP doesn't want a full impute. So you, you, uh, whenever you kind of have that processing of data, you come up with a zero. It has a possibility of introducing um, alterations that aren't desirable. Um, I, I, yeah, that, that's true. But also uh, to add to that, main reason is if we have zero, zero is also a token somewhere too, right? It's an understanding. So we want to say, well, let's just say it's a very big value or a very small value, right? And if we do that. So in our case, we're trying to understand how important a thing is. So if we get a very negative value, it's saying it's not that important, right? And that's basically, okay, we have zero. And if zero, we find a zero, we'll just say negative 10, what is it, 10 to the 10th. I, don't forget, I forget what that is. 10 giga, <laughs> one giga. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a very small it's a very it's a very big number in the negative, right? So it's a very negative number. It's not a very small number, but uh, but yeah, it's not the yeah, it's straight. So we'll, we'll go to the decoder. Um, self dot m. So again, so we want to do embedding. So embedding is equal to n n dot embed. Oh. Uh, oops, we'll say output dim. All right, and then uh, embedding dim. And then we're going to create our RNN again. Self dot RNN is equal to NN dot GRU and encode hid dim times two. Uh, okay, I'll just do that. Embedding dimension. And then of course we want the decoder output. Our decoder hidden dimension. All right. And one more fully connected FC. All well, those columns FC out is equal to nn dot linear, and then this one is of course encode hid dim times two plus decode hid dim plus embed uh, dim, and then output dim. All right, that's our last layer, so it's the output, and we're basically running a fully connected layer on the output of the RNN. Uh, but you'll see that later. <clears throat> and then self.dropout is equal to uh, and then dot drop out drop out. Oof, this is not good for my carpal tunnel. So input is equal to input dot unsqueeze zero, uh, and then we're going to go for the em embed. It's embedding. So self dot dropout, self dot em embedding 
and then the input. All right, so we've converted it to some form of an embedding, and then I'm going to say attention is equal to self dot ten. Yeah, we define attention. Good. Okay, good. Attention and hidden. Uh, oh, we also need the encoder output. Encoder output and the mask. Uh, this one we define the mask, right? Good. And now we're going to say weighted torch dot BMM which it's like by value matrix multiplication, binary matrix multiplication. What does it stand for? Binary? It's basically you have two matrices and you can... Uh, I think it's batch matrix. Batch matrix multiplication. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Trying to remember the name of it. Um, so now we have some weighted expression of whatever we've dealt with so far. So our attention and the encoder output, right? And that's really, you know, we've basically done this, you know, connection part, right? The dotted lines. Okay. Uh, so we're going to say weighted dot permute. Uh, 1 comma 0 comma 2 again forcing a square a round object or square object in a round hole uh, RNN input is equal to torch dot cat um, embedded I have too many M's or actually not you I need embedding and weighted and dim equals to our output hidden go self dot rnn rnn So now we've defined our hidden uh, our RNN by itself. And now runtime disconnected. Nah, it's fine. We don't need you. Um, embedded is equal to M. Um, here. I just copy you. Oh, I spelled this wrong. I spilled it right everywhere else. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so embedding. Uh, is equal to squeeze one. Uh, I need a U. And then our output is equal to output dot squeeze one. Uh, and then we have a weighted, which is equal to weight. Oh no, these are all squeeze zero. Yeah, sorry, zero. Yeah. Uh, is it too small? Can you see? Or? Okay. Just let me know. <laughs> Yeah, let me try and get rid of those. Where are they? Settings. That was miscellaneous. Some power, no power. We don't need you. Okay. Oh, I'm not turning that on. You can find it for yourself. You can run it on yourself on your own time, but that's too much. It's too much power. Weighted that squeeze zero. Again, I forgot the U. All right. This is a common trend today, isn't it? 
Uh, it's one of those days. So now we're going to say prediction is equal to self dot f c. What did I name it? F C out? Yes, I named it F C out. F C out. Torch dot cat. Output weighted. Oops, I spelled weighted wrong. Weighted embedding and we want to cat them on the uh, dim one yes and now we're going to return prediction hidden dot squee zero uh, a dot squeeze one and that should technically work. Um, in Python, the term of the are those stored in the tuple? Uh, technically, yes, but you don't have to define the tuple. You return a pi object. That's what you return. Pi object. Yeah, if you ever looked at the C backend for a pi object, that's, that's basically the bread and butter. So now we're going to define our sequence, sequence model. Finally, we have to put these pieces together, right? So we have this stuff right here, basically creates all of our you know, local variables. So all we're going to do is just write the return function, or the, okay, my tabbing is off. Okay, there we go. We're going to define our forward function. Uh, and this one's a little bit more complicated, we'll walk through it. So we need batch size is equal to src dot, uh, oops, src dot size zero. Oh, shape, my bad. Okay, and then we're going to get the target length, which is equal to trg dot shape dot zero, and then we want to get the target vocab length, which is equal to self dot decoder dot output dim, not docker decoder. Um. So now we're going to say outputs is equal to torch dot zeros. Oops, torch, not trotch. Torch dot zeros. Uh, to RG len. And then batch size. And then TRG vocab size. All right, and then we're going to send this one to the device. What is that? Hmm? Which one? This one? Uh, it outputs a tensor of zeros of a specific size. And what is that? What's determining the size? What is defining the size? All that we've defined up here. All right, so the first dimension will be, I mean, this, if you want to think about it, like the lowest dimension will equal this, the second lowest the higher, in the hierarchy will equal this, and the, la the final dimension will equal this, right, target length. And if you want to, you can just print out the shape of this. Right. Um, granted, we have to do it at the end, but yeah. <laughs> to device, we have to send it to GPU. GPU is device, we tend to think of it as, so you need to tensor, like all applications have two different devices, the host, which is the CPU, and the device, which is GPU typically, right? And so we want to send, uh, our, we have to tell the program to send that data to the GPU, otherwise it won't. And so, um, you know, this is why we have this. So since we're creating a new tensor, It'll, uh, it has to be sent to the GPU. But if we, once we create the model, like you know how we're defining everything in init, right? All these variables, right? We, these will already automatically be sent to the GPU at the first function. I'll, I'll show you when we get to the training loop of where we send them to the GPU. Or actually, I think it's like right here. Yeah, see? So we send all the weights to the GPU. So the model is already loaded in the GPU. And so if we're calling forward, forward is outside the GPU. We're calling forward on the CPU. And if we create this torch tensor here, it'll only create it on the CPU, won't create a copy on the GPU. And so now we inside the forward loop, we have to say our forward function, we have to tell it, hey, 
send, we create the copy on CPU, and then send that data to the GPU. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, this is the reason that we're using Colab is because it's Google Cloud Store system, so it's found on the Colab runtime. Yeah, it's like eight gigabytes. So your model can only be eight gigabytes in size for G on GPU. So it's not too big, but it's big enough for most models. So you can't train like you know the most powerful language model in the world, but. Uh, not that much. This is a very small model. You can increase the size. That's why I have the hyperparameters at the top of the file. Right? You can play around that with that on your own time. Right? But uh, let's let's finish this so that um, if we have time, I can I can go over like transformers so we can do like some cool stuff. Uh, encoder outputs uh, hidden uh, is equal to self dot Encoder uh, source source len. Okay. So now we've done this. Uh, we need to get, so we'll say input is equal to target uh, zero, comma, this. And then the mask, I'll say a self dot create mask. SRC. Ooh, that seems to be an underscore. Um, so now we're going to create kind of this iterative loop. So if you notice it, it's kind of like a loop, right? So we're taking our input here and putting it down here. And then we run this model. Then we do the same thing again. We say, oh, we have to take this input, put it down here, and run it again, right? So this is kind. This is the difference between an encoder and a decoder pipeline. An encoding deep pipeline can look at the entire sequence at once. A decoder pipeline needs to take it in chunks, and so you need to iterate through this pipeline, right? Iteratively process the set, uh, set sequence, um, and so that's what we're going to do now, right? So I mean, it's as straightforward as creating a for loop uh, for t in len or range. Uh, one comma target len, right? So we're going to create this, and it's going to only go to the you know target length, um, and our target length is defined by um, the output data. So output hidden, and we're going to we're going to more the last comma value uh, self dot decoder, uh, and then input hidden encoder outputs mask, All right? So that's the inputs for the decoder. And then we're going to say outputs bracket t is equal to, equals to outputs, All right? Or, oops, output. Uh, uh, it's just the index. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so our outputs is right here, All right? So we're, now we're filling this vector up. Uh, Right. We defined it to be zero. Now we're putting values in it slowly, right? incrementing it. <clears throat> uh, and then so something for attention is some, we have a function called teacher forcing ratio. Um, and this is a hyperparameter you can adjust. Uh, random dot random and teach forcing ratio. Uh, and then top L is equal to output dot argmax one input. So now we're going to rerun the loop with the new output, right? And this output, is, or sorry, we're going to run it with a new input, right? So we're trying to sequence through the the, the uh, structure or the target value, or sorry, the input value, right? Uh, and to do that. Right, to do the translation part, we need to now create a new input. And that input is basically, so target dash t, uh, if, you know, okay, so we'll do this. Uh, and this one. Or, actually, we don't want to redefine the variable. We'll just say that. Yeah, my bad. 
uh, else top though. And this is just a simple way of training the network to respond to line one of five. Uh, oh, it's ratio. Basically, it's our high parameter that we're passing it. And this is a hyperparameter you can adjust to. Uh huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a true or false? Uh, it is the, it's like the uh, uh, ID of uh, the uh, output, right? So <clears throat> think of it like, like, so when we tokenize a sentence, we create a sequence of numbers, right? And so if those sequence of numbers are essentially the index in which we can find that value in a very large vocab list, right? That's how we're tokenizing. We're not creating it. We're, our embedding is being trained by the neural network, right? So that vector that we saw before is being trained when we say embedding. That's what happens. Uh, but our tokens are created premature uh, before when we pass it in with Spacey, right? Spacey does the tokenization for us. Space is an open source library of natural language processing tools. So more powerful NLTK, so to speak. Natural language toolkit. Okay, and then we should be done. Oh, uh, uh, okay, let's run the show. <laughs> if I run all, uh, let's hope there's no errors. Input, uh, it is our target value, our first value in our target. Is this a hmm? It's a tensor. Yeah, it's a tensor. It's not all this comprehension. This is a tensor. Yeah. We're dealing with tensors. There's no lists here. It's an nth dimensional matrix. It's nth dimensional. So there's, so a vector is one dimension, matrix is two dimensional, tensor is n. You can have a million dimensions, granted that's gonna be slow as hell. Well, depends on how big the dimensions are. Uh, what was the error? Invalid syntax. Is uh, also Where exactly is this error? <coughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Tuple? What is it? Topol. Return outputs, comma, hidden. Where is the syntax error? Oh, I'm missing a parenthesis. Let's see if that worked. And then we have our training loop here. And it takes about like two seconds to train the on GPU. Oh, and that pox. I forgot another hyperparameter. God, did this not save? Um, you, okay. Uh, we said 10. I think we can go with like eight. We're saving. I don't care what you say. I will force you to save. Okay. Target vocab size. Where did I go wrong? Uh, oh, I called it vocab land. Oops. Uh, packed padded sequence. No, I don't want to search Stack Overflow. I want to go to the error. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what it's named. Is it pad pack sequence? Oh, yeah, it's the other way around. Packed. 
Wait, uh, Anthony, uh, Andrew, sorry, can you unlock your laptop real quick? I had it right. I knew it. Oh yeah. Go back. Yeah. No. Uh. Where the model go? Oh, that's awkward. Control M Z. Come back to me. Okay. So it's pad, packed sequence. This is correct. If you don't work, I will be mad. Hmm. Line 24? Yeah, you're using it twice, so... 24? Like the line before the one you just changed. You use it multiple times, right? Pack, 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 pack. Oh, it doesn't matter. No, no, no. Like this one? Oh, this... These are two separate functions, right, no. Right, okay, I see it now. Yeah, no, you're I chilling. Thought you were, I thought you were using it twice. Uh, did you not... Oh, this is a different one. My bad. Um, I need you. Mm. Oh, it's not packed. It's pack. This is pack padded sequence. This one's pad packed sequence. <laughs> Basically, you're doing one thing and then you're undoing that thing later. All right. No, oh, I get you. I got you. BMM, what do you? BMM is always going to cause an error. It always happens every single time. Let's see. I'm pretty sure it's because the shapes might be off. Do do do. Okay, so a encoder out. Um, do you not like something that I am not doing? <sighs> Wait. What's BMM do? Uh, batch mult mat mol. Um, okay, what's your error exactly? 3D tensor, CU boss is throwing an error. So that is in decoder, so we are going to look at you. Sequence to sequence. <laughs> Finding output, target self encoder, target vocab len, batch size, target land, ya boy. This is. Oh, here we go. That's a one. What's this error? Okay, it's always somewhere else, you know? So we keep walking up. We should see it somewhere. So I know it's here. Um, did I unsqueeze anything correctly? Oh, ah, there it is. I did not squeeze. I do have to unsqueeze, not to unsqueeze. See, I told you, it's like fitting a... Uh, fitting a... Uh, square peg in a round hole. Ah, yes, what is the error now? Don't tell me it's BMM still. You still don't like me. How come? I gave you so much. It's because I did not permeate properly. Encoder outputs. Oh, I forgot to permute you. That's why. Clip. 
Ah, that's another thing that I did not define. So we'll just say clip is equal to 1.0. It's a little hyperparameter I set. If you're completely interested, you can look at yourself. Uh, it's for the training loop. This looks promising. Fun times, right? I'm out of the camera. Wait. Hmm. So, it takes about 30 to 40 seconds per run. So, 10 runs. Yeah, three minutes. Anyone have any questions? You guys interested in making a, a fun little side program? So, in the meantime. Hmm? Do we? Oh. Huh? You're saying? Mm hmm. You might have a large number of YouTube subscribers. Mm hmm. And you have the op option of what, what, what are some commercial applications of the channel? What, what could you do? Um, it's used a lot in like help desks. You know, people have questions and they, they phrase them in a bunch of ways, and you want to direct them to the correct way. I've seen it used for that. Um, like Amazon. Yes, they use those. Oh, do they? So what well, you're talking about chatbots. So most chatbots in companies today are flow diagrams, right? So you give one input, it should give you another output. Um, another way of doing that is, uh, so let me open up a new notebook actually. So this is for fun, make something cool. Uh, another thing that you can think about is like, uh, Yes. Well, it's not that kind of transformer, but you know, if it, it's a much more powerful language model. And you might have heard about it, how it is the, so to speak, the most powerful language model in the world. Multi head model. There we go. Didn't they just release another paper that's like the next generation of transformers? I mean, there's always a new paper everywhere. LM head model. Um, oh. I'm sorry, what, what is this uh, uh, From what I know, Transformers was uh, the initial paper. I could be totally wrong. It's, got, it's called the paper is called uh, Attention is All You Need. So we built an intention model, right? So one of the reasons that we don't like LSTMs is because we don't read like that either, <laughs> right? So a lot of guys, it's, it's, so we're basically wasting compute for no reason, right? I think that's the general consensus that we don't read like LSTMs read, therefore what's the point of them? So instead, what if we make a new, more powerful model or since we read like how attention kind of works, right? attention looks at the whole sentence, kind of creates a weighted average of what is the most important key phrases and then passes out onto the next layer, right? And so we said, okay, get rid of everything else, we'll just use that. Right? We'll only use attention. Attention, some normalization, some MATMO with some large matrix, right? So it becomes a feed-forward network. And we'll create two pipelines, an encoder and a decoder, right? In our case, we're using the decoding pipeline. So remember I said how there's a difference between an encoder and decoder? Can you tell me what it is? Uh, the encoder reads, reads the entire thing. Yeah. yeah that's it. And then the encoder, the encoder uh, yeah, the encoder reads the entire thing. The decoder kind of just... You, just, you need to go sequentially, right? You have to pass on the, like the previous value. So that's kind of the reason that it's kind of cool to use that, but. Um, so. I'm trying to see. 
These are very quick and easy because this thing is still... What are you doing? No, I don't know what you... So there you go. So it's training. It takes... Wow, four minutes. Jesus Christ. What are you running on? Change runtime type. GPU, huh? <laughs> it took me 30 seconds last time. I guess it's... Throttling you. Throttling me, yes. They were like, ah, what is this kid doing? Because you can change the dimension size and make it faster, but four minutes is a long time. Uh, let me see if I can get my original one working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. Done. Runtime. GPT. TPU. Okay. Tensor processing is an ASIC. Uh, ASIC is application specific. Uh, application specific integrated circuit. There we go. Um, and so all that means is uh, whenever you are working with, you know, really large, like, data structures or data sets, you can make a circuit that does it. Circuit does it in one cycle. Computers tend to do it in multiple cycles, right? Each cycle is one, you know, you can calculate cycles by, you know, we typically say gigahertz, right? That's the number of cycles per second. Right, the CPU can maybe manage four gigahertz on average uh, on single core. TPU at one gigahertz, it might be a lot slower in terms of its clock speed, but you can do every calculation in one cycle. Whereas a GPU or a CPU needs to do multiple load, read, fetch, so you can optimize a pipeline. That's what TPU is great for. What's the hard part is the software for TPUs. It's a lot more complicated because you need to schedule in. All data structures aren't the same. So, you know, GPUs, we created kind of an infrastructure behind it. Um, TPUs are brand new devices, so there's not much to really back it, right? So there's not like driver guys who are really versed, well versed in TPU technology, right? And every company has a different TPU. So you need different compilers, different software stacks. So it's kind of like, you know, so it's quite a bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this one we're using PyTorch. Yeah, yeah, we're using PyTorch. So, so the PyTorch has actually enabled uh, the binary for TPUs. So yeah, you can run this on TPU, uh, which is pretty cool, right? Um, for the most part, like so, they, we've they've integrated the compiler code for that. So you just have to set the device. There's like an entire workflow of, okay, you have to, you know, instead of saying GPU, when you set the device, right? Instead of saying GPU or CPU, uh, you basically say like XLA device or something like that. Um, there's any, I don't know exact documentation, so don't con don't uh, quote me on it. But uh, yeah, um, it's pretty. Pretty new stuff, so uh, let's see. Does this one work? Yeah, this one should work. Uh, you are an LM label, aren't you? No, double head model. Why are we defining CLS class? Yeah, it's pretty much the most cutting edge. Um, so I'm trying to find a really nice example that we can use. Uh, typically, uh, we'd want, uh, you know, uh, we'd want to like have something where like you can you can kind of see the power. So GPT-2 is a text generation. It's called NLG, Natural Language Generation. So you give it some amount of words. And nowadays Google uses this in like Gmail, right? So whenever you open up Gmail and you try and type something, it'll try and autofill. And that's using GPT-2. Uh, granted, it's like a custom model that they have internally. Um, so it's, it's a 
right now it's a big deal because everybody's trying to use it. Uh, here we go. Let's just see what we see from this. Okay. Yeah, and a good good way of understanding that is, uh, or like you, you should you should ask the question of why, right? Um, I think the reason that they do that is because, um, you know, you want to kind of let the network uh, print. It's not shade. So right now I'm trying to figure out first if this is possible. No match for okay, so we have to add one more line. Uh, bang pip install transform. Mm -hmm. uh, this will so what you're doing is you're creating a container. Right, so have you ever dealt with Docker containers? Okay, so a container basically is a self-contained environment, right? And whatever you do in that environment will, you know, uh, you know, doesn't really matter to the uh, individual OS. Yeah, I spelled it wrong. Okay. <coughs> mm -hmm. So whatever you tell in terms of code. It will go and fetch and do that data. Is there some way of configuring What do you mean by global dependent? What do you need externally? I mean, like, if there's certain tooling, there's certain tooling that you know the old is all this one, rather than having to. While well, you can have one block of code that does that for you. It right, goes and downloads, fetches, runs that code. A script? Yeah, a script in the beginning. So if you like. I'm doing, you know, pip install transformers, right? It says that all of it's already there, so it's downloading the model, which is 6.3 gigabytes, but that's something else. I guess we're talking about slightly different things. Mm -hmm. A script, you still have to... You have to run and download, yeah. Do this every time. Yeah. But what if you could configure your call-out environment? To auto do this? Well, that means that Google now has to keep a store on... You can fetch from Google Drive... That's if you, have, if you have like a dependency you know you're going to use a lot. You can fetch from Google Drive. You just give Google call that permission to access Google Drive. So anytime you start a new session, it'll ask for your code. You just go put in your code, and then it'll fetch your Google Drive code. Would that be any different than doing this where you still have to wait for the dependencies of the tool to install? Um, I mean, I'd say yes. It is different. This one... Again, you'd still have to install the binaries. The binaries themselves would have to install. So, like, actually, yeah, yeah, you you would have to, you know, do this process specifically. But like, the transfer speed would be faster. Um, in this case, we have quite a bit of data. Granted, it's still forty megabytes per second. That's insane. Hence, why it's taking like a minute. Yeah, you can't trust the school Wi-Fi on that. Well, it's not 40 megabytes to your computer, right? It's, it's 4 gigabytes to the server that's running our container. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a fiber optic? It's directly server to server. It's not even fiber optic at that point. I mean, network. the network is based not on the cabling. Network speeds are based on the switches. Right. So if you have a 10 gigabit switch... You can theoretically.
it off. Nope. Note that. Start recording. Okay.